My name is Dean Gugasian, and I have the privilege of serving as the president of the Oakland County Bar Association. Tonight, you will be able to listen to two candidates tell you why they believe they are the best person to serve you and your fellow citizens as a judge at the Michigan Court of Appeals, second district. A judge is asked every day to make important decisions, apply the law and act as society's referee. If the judge is biased, incompetent or intemperate, then everybody loses and justice is not served. On November 5th, you will be asked to make one of the most important decisions voters are called on to make. The decision is to who should serve as judge in your district, probate, circuit, and appeals courts, and the Michigan Supreme Court. Judicial elections are perhaps the least understood elections. Therefore, the Oakland County Bar Association, in collaboration with the League of Women Voters of Oakland area, the Oakland County Legal News, and the Oakland County Times, conducts judicial candidate forums in each district and court in Oakland County with a contested race, to help you make the important selection of the appropriate judge, a decision that could affect you and your family for years to come. The American Bar Association, the National Association of Lawyers that has advised presidents for over 50 years on the selection of judges, has outlined the following eight factors to consider in selecting good, honest, competent, and hardworking judges. We endorse these factors and recommend them for your consideration as well. The first one is integrity. Is the candidate honest and open? Have they led an exemplary life? And will they be an example to those whose cases they must decide? The second factor is legal knowledge and ability. Has the candidate demonstrated knowledge of the law, either by good grades in school, teaching at seminars, or simply demonstrating that they speak and write clearly and well? The third factor is professional experience. It is difficult to think of a judge who can competently hear disputes if the judge has not had much experience in the courtroom as a lawyer or other equivalent experience resolving disputes. The fourth factor is judicial temperament. Will the candidate be a judge who has a positive attitude, acts professionally, and treats all people with dignity and respect? And most importantly, is the candidate likely to remain impartial throughout all of the dispute resolution process? The fifth factor is diligence. Is the candidate likely to be a hard worker who efficiently manages a caseload and decides cases promptly and always is fully prepared? The sixth factor, what is the candidate's state of health? Is there anything about the candidate's physical or mental health that would interfere with their ability to complete an entire term or perform the duties of a judge? The seventh factor is financial responsibility. Has the individual demonstrated prudence and responsibility in their own financial affairs? Does the candidate's record of financial responsibility reflect on whether they would serve the citizen read well? And the eighth and final factor is the question of public service. Serving on the judiciary is a significant act of public service. Has the candidate demonstrated the worthiness to accept this awesome position of responsibility by showing leadership in other organizations that have benefited the community throughout their past life. We strongly urge you to keep these factors in mind as you listen to the candidates speak. And most importantly, remember to vote on the nonpartisan judicial ballot. Thank you for your attention and your interest in good government. And now here is Christine Allen for the League of Women Voters, Oakland area, our forum moderator. Thank you, Dean. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this forum for the Judicial Candidate Forum for the Michigan Court of Appeals Second District Non-Incumbent Race. Today is September 26, 2024. This forum will be featuring the candidates who have filed for the Court of Appeals Second District Non-Incumbent Race in Oakland County. There are two candidates for the six-year term. Vote for one. Sponsors of this forum are the League of Women Voters Oakland Area, the Oakland County Bar Association, the Oakland County Legal News, the Oakland County Times, and the Bloomfield Community Television. I am Christine Allen, a member of the League of Women Voters, Oakland area. The League of Women Voters is a trusted non national nonpartisan political organization. Our members do the hands-on work to safeguard democracy. 
While we never endorse a candidate, we are directly involved in shaping the important issues that keep our community strong. As a League of Women Voters member, I have the opportunity to contribute in a leadership role such as this one that has great impact on local, state, and even national issues. If you are interested in learning about how you can make a similar impact, I would encourage you to visit our website at lwvoa.org. The League of Women Voters and the Oakland County Bar Association do not endorse any candidate or political party. The Oakland County Legal News may endorse candidates after this forum. The views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates and the sponsors take no responsibility. The candidates in alphabetical order are Matthew Ackerman, Ackerman and Ackerman PC, Latoya Marie Willis, Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. The format for this forum has been established by the sponsors. Please power off or silence and put away all electronic devices, including cell phones. No pictures or recordings are allowed. We ask that candidates answer the questions with their views only and not to interrupt the other candidate. Audience members are asked to remain silent during the recording of this forum. The candidates will be answering questions from our panelists, Tom Curvan, Editor-in-Chief of Oakland County Legal News, and Stephen McKen McKenney from the OCBA. Uh, questions submitted, and I will be submitting questions that are submitted from the audience. Our question screeners are Emily Thomas, Judge Bill Richards, uh, and Jason's not here. Uh, please submit your written questions to the pages, Carrie Ross and Janice uh, Thies, and they're over there. So if you have any questions, uh, raise your hand, they'll get you a three by five card and you can fill that out. Thank you. The format is as follows. All candidates will be given one minute for opening statements in alphabetical order. Closing statements will be one minute in reverse alphabetical order. Candidates will have one minute to answer each question unless the time is altered by one of the moderators or panelists. Um, sorry, all candidates will be allowed equal time to answer questions. Terry Benjamin will be our timer and indicate to candidates when they have 15 seconds left and then when they must stop speaking. We will begin with a one minute opening statements. Mr. Ackerman. Well, thank you for hosting us here. Um, the Michigan Court of Appeals is responsible for resolving our most complex legal issues across all areas of law. To serve effectively, a judge must possess sharp intellect, a strong work ethic, and excellent research and writing abilities. My name is Matthew Ackerman, and I have the skill set, experience, and dedication required to meet those demands. I graduated with high honors in economics from Harvard University and at the top of my class at Columbia Law School, where I served on the Law Review. I went on to clerk for two judges on the Federal Court of Appeals, where I drafted dozens of opinions in high-stakes civil and criminal cases. I currently practice at Ackerman & Ackerman, where I represent property owners in eminent domain cases. In addition to my busy practice, I regularly publish legal articles and blogs and will soon teach at Michigan State's Law School. My passion for the law and its complexities drives me. I love reading, researching, and writing on challenging legal issues, which is why this position appeals to me. I'm ready to serve the people of Michigan with integrity, and I'd be honored to have your support. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Willis? Good evening. Thank you all for coming out to learn about us candidates. I am Latoya Marie Willis. I'm a wife. I'm a mother of two children, both of whom are in college now, and for the last 21 years, I've been an assistant prosecuting attorney in the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. The Wayne County Prosecutor's Office is one of the busiest prosecutor's offices in the nation. And in my time there over the course of 21 years, I've handled over a thousand cases, all types of subject matter, different types of complexity. Currently, I'm the lead attorney over the mortgage and deed fraud unit. Uh, it's a first of its kind task force in, this, in the state. And in that role, I prosecute all cases involving fraudulent transfers of real property mortgage fraud, and criminal enterprise. I am the current outgoing chair of the Attorney Grievance Commission appointed by the Michigan Supreme Court. I am running for this seat because I believe experience matters, integrity matters, and representation matters. Thank you. Thank you. We will now begin the question segment of our forum. We will begin with Mr. Curvan with a question for Mr. Ackerman. 
Please describe an ethical dilemma you faced during your career and how you resolved it. Okay, great question. Um, I had a case where we represented a property owner whose land was taken for a government project. And I don't want to disclose details about the um, client's business, but we felt as though the client was misrepresenting the strength of the business and some of the key components. And we didn't feel comfortable representing that client. So we withdrew from the case and, um, you know, did our, did our best. It was, you know, would have been a, a good case if he had reported things honestly, but we lost that trust with our client and, and had to sever that relationship. And that's, that's how we, we handled that situation. Thank you. Ms. Willis. I can remember a time where I had, I was in the middle of a jury trial, uh, jury seated, testimony is going on. And in the course of this trial, it becomes evident that uh, defense counsel is missing some of the discovery. Uh, I can tell that because of some of the statements and comments that he's making. And so uh, when that becomes apparent to me, I ask for a sidebar, we approach the judge and I, you know, we have a conversation about the case and, and the evidence and whether or not this attorney has the evidence. And it turns out that he was missing the, uh, some pertinent discovery uh, and neither one of us were aware of it. I could have sat and kept silent uh, because he didn't know he didn't have the discovery, but I believe that it is my obligation as a prosecuting attorney uh, to ensure that justice is done. And the only way that that is done is to ensure that a defense counsel is completely apprised of the evidence that's in the case. Thank you. Uh, the next question will be from Mr. McKinney and we'll go to Ms. Willis. Good evening. Um, the Michigan Court of Appeals handles an incredible breadth of different types of cases, civil cases, criminal cases, family law cases, administrative appeals uh, from administrative agencies. No judge comes to the Court of Appeals with experience in all of those areas. There are gaps in their knowledge from their experience or gaps between their experience and, and what they'll be asked to decide. Uh, my question to each of you is, what have you done to fill in those gaps uh, where you don't have experience in an area of law, but you'll be asked to decide questions in that area of law? In other words, what have you done to prepare to serve as a Court of Appeals judge on January 1st? So one, I believe my 21 years in the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office prepares me uh, tremendously. In that time, I've not just done standard criminal justice, uh, criminal felony cases, I have done hybrid types of cases, even in the role that I currently hold as the lead attorney over mortgage and deed fraud. Those are not your standard criminal types of cases. Uh, when I first came into the office, I worked uh, in the abandoned property forfeiture unit, and that was a civil, civil criminal quasi type of unit where I did both types of cases. Uh, as far as areas that I don't, don't understand, I'm always learning. I'm always researching, I'm always inquiring, asking people who are experts in the area. Uh, as uh, a member on the Michigan Attorney Grievance Commission, I've come across lots of different subject areas that I have not practiced myself. Uh, and I have to research those issues. I had to learn those issues. I had to consult with individuals who knew about uh, those issues. And I would continue to do that same thing as a judge on the Michigan Court of Appeals. Thank you. Mr. Eckman? So as a law clerk on the Federal Court of Appeals, I got to see all different types of issues, civil and criminal, and even within that, things like bankruptcy, uh, appeals from jury trials, uh, criminal sentencing, new statutes, uh, a lot of constitutional issues in the wake of COVID-19. It, it was one of the things that I loved the most about the job was really having to dig deep and learn more about those areas of law because no one goes into it with knowledge about each area. And I think I have the intellect and skill set and baseline knowledge to be able to be adept and handle those different areas of law. I think that's one of the things that appeals to me about this position is that I'll always be learning. I'll always be challenging myself with different areas. And, and, and I, I look forward to, to serving that, you know, doing that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. One of the questions from the audience. And we'll start with uh, Mr. Eckerman. The Court of Appeals primarily operates 
not in front of your average citizen. How would you describe why what an appeals court judge does matters? Well, the Court of Appeals matters because it's it's the Court of Correction. We have our great trial court judges. Our circuit court is fantastic in Oakland County, but you need you need people that are going to work hard and and to thoroughly review whether things were sometimes missed or done incorrectly. It's where you go when you have those difficult legal issues and you think that it was decided incorrectly and you get a second chance with a panel of three judges that can review those legal issues and 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 research the law and write an opinion describing what what the ruling is. It's where most cases that are uh, contested end because the Supreme Court has discretion to choose which cases it generally gets to review. And that's why the, the Court of Appeals is so important. Thank you. Ms. Willis? Can you repeat the question? Sure. The Court of Appeals primarily operates not in front of your average citizen. How would you describe why what an appeals court judge does matters? So I've been describing what the job on the Court of Appeals is to people as the equivalent of, I need to speak to your manager. It is that call that you make when you receive uh, a decision that you believe was not right, and you need to speak to someone who you're hoping has more experience than whoever you just got finished speaking with. And so that's how I describe the role of the judge on the Court of Appeals. And when you get to the Court of Appeals, you're hoping to get to someone who not just has knowledge, but someone who has actually practiced in that area, someone who understands what happens inside of that courtroom. Uh, and the, ju the, the judges that are on that Court of Appeals are not just making decisions that are impacting the parties that are in that court on that particular day, but they're making decisions that are setting precedent, decisions that are affecting generations to come. And so it is important, it's incumbent that whoever sits in those seats uh, have experience to review and to make decisions about whether or not judges on the lower courts, attorneys on the lower courts uh, made the right decision and made the right call. Thank you. The next question will come from Mr. McKinney and we'll start with Ms. Willis. This is a question for both of you. I did a little bit of research before I came here tonight and <clears throat> looking at the Michigan Court of Appeals website, it appeared as though Mr. Ackerman, you have never argued in front of the Michigan Court of Appeals. Uh, Ms. Uh, Willis, you've argued one time in front of the Michigan Court of Appeals, and it was 20 years ago. My question is, why are you running for a court that you infrequently practice in front of? I'm starting with Ms. Willis. So just for transparency, I have never actually, I've never practiced in front of the Court of Appeals. I'm not sure where that information came from. I've always been a trial lawyer in the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. I'm running for the seat though, because I believe after practicing as an attorney for 21 years, I understand the importance of the role that the Court of Appeals plays. I've been asked by a number of people, why not run for a seat on the trial court? Uh, I don't really have a desire to run for a seat on the trial court. My passion is for the Court of Appeals. I have a um, deep seated, uh, desire to protect the integrity of the decisions that come out of the Court of Appeals. I believe that we need individuals who are not only experienced, but individuals who uh, are committed to ensuring that decisions are being made that are based on evidence, law, and the Constitution. And that's why I'm running for the Court of Appeals. Mr. Ackerman? I don't think that's reflective of my experience. I have a lot of appellate experience doing exactly what the Court of Appeals judge does. I got to review briefs from both sides and draft legal bench memoranda for federal appellate judges recommending how to resolve cases. And then I got to draft the opinions. It's exactly what we're looking for. I think that's even more valuable experience than appearing before our Court of Appeals. That doesn't mean that I don't have difficult legal issues and motions and I don't write um, academic articles and presented at legal conferences in terms of the complex statutory and constitutional issues we have in eminent domain cases. But I do have a lot of appellate experience, even if it doesn't mean that I've, I've appeared as an advocate. I think I've, I've uh, gone a step further in, in actually drafting cases and seeing the inner workings of two federal court of counterparts for what we're doing. The, uh, you know, that, that had high stakes cases that made national news and, and impacted a lot of people. And where a lot of them were ultimately reviewed by our Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you. 
The next question will come from Mr. Curvan, and Mr. Ackerman will start. How would you handle a situation where your personal beliefs conflict with established law or legal precedent? I'm humble enough to, to know that, that my role as a judge is to say what the law is, not what I want it to be. So what my personal views are is subservient to what the statute or the precedent is. I think maybe if I think that the precedent is incorrect, you could write a separate opinion explaining why and maybe hope that it gets reviewed by, um, by the Supreme Court to reverse the precedent. But as a, a state intermediate appellate judge, I am beholden to the precedent established by the state Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals in prior opinions. So my opinion is secondary. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Willis? I would say that as an assistant prosecutor over the course of the last 21 years, I have prosecuted many a case that I did not agree with uh, the statute about. Uh, I had a personal belief or opinion that differed greatly from the statute that I was uh, prosecuting an individual under. Uh, at the end of the day, it does not matter what my personal beliefs are. Uh, it doesn't matter as a prosecutor and as a judge on the Court of Appeals, it wouldn't matter. I would set aside uh, any personal beliefs or opinions that I have about any particular precedent or case as I have done uh, for my entire legal career. I believe that the role of the judge is not to legislate from the bench, but to uh, apply the law uh, as it's written. The, the, the task of the Court of Appeals judge is to review the evidence, uh, to apply the law, uh, and, and it's just that simple. And that's what I would do. Thank you. The next question. Court of Appeals opinions are binding on other panels. Is this good or not and why? And we'll start with Ms. Willis. I believe that it's a good thing. It's good because these opinions that are being written by the Court of Appeals are, are not, again, simply for the parties that are before the Court of Appeals. It's for the parties that are below the Court of Appeals, people that are coming into the courtroom, are seeking guidance about how to proceed on a case. Uh, and in order for people to operate smoothly and correctly in the lower courts, there needs to be established law. And the task of the Court of Appeals is to do that, to establish the guidance and the, the law that's necessary for people to abide by. And so I believe that if a decision is made by one panel, it should be binding on the other panel or else you come up with a lot of confusion. And so I, I think it's a good thing. Thank you, Mr. Eckerman. I actually agree. I think that it would lead to a lot of unpredictability if your Court of Appeals opinion that's directly on point doesn't hold water for another Court of Appeals case. It would mean that there's a lot more litigation. Issues aren't settled. They're going to continue to be litigated. There are litigation costs. There are court costs. There's uncertainty for people arranging their affairs based on what the interpretation of the statute is. That's really important. I think a, a maybe more interesting issue that I saw two different circuits handle differently is on the Federal Court of Appeals, some uh, uh, precedent is decided by when a case was heard in terms of oral argument and in other circuits, it's decided based on when the opinion is issued. So there's conflict when a uh, new statute is interpreted and there are multiple cases uh, percolating and different panels may have different interpretations of the law. And that, that I find interesting and I have a pretty strong opinion that it should be when it's, it's, it's argued. So you have certainty and not a rush to, to, to you know, shoot out opinions. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Mr. Curvan and it will go to Mr. Eckerman. Describe your management experience and style and how you would work with law clerks and other court staff. I'm extremely punctual. I'm a very type A and organized on every single uh, subject matter we have for cases, whether it's outlines in law school or handling cases as a law clerk, I have table of contents and Excel spreadsheets that, that track the cases. I would like to adopt the same practices that I saw from the judges I clerked for in terms of case management and making sure that we don't let any cases slip and that we're on top of, of, of moving things forward 
Um, we had a merits cases tracker in, in one of my clerkships that managed all the uh, future oral arguments, cases that have been uh, decided, that have uh, had oral argument but have not been issued, and the ones that have been issued. And I, I would try to manage it and keep it as organized and easy to navigate for my law clerks as possible. I tend to be hands off as long as the work is getting done in terms of when people operate and in and, and that fashion. So I think I'm an easygoing boss, but I would also be uh, an extremely organized, uh, easy to work with and, and navigate one. Ms. Willis. So I currently manage uh, a unit right now, um, and my management style is basically I like to try to find the best style for each individual. We each have different um, personality styles, and my goal is to pull out the, your, your, your best out of each individual, uh, however you operate, however you function best to get the most productivity out of you. And so that is basically my style. I try to do it on an individual basis. What works for me uh, may not work for the next person. You know, I have a particular style, a particular organizational uh, technique that I like to follow, but that's not always going to work for everyone. I even see it when I manage, you know, children. Everyone has a different personality and a different style. And so the goal is to get the best productivity out of each individual. I do that uh, by, you know, some people need more hands on, some people need more hands off. And so, it's an individual style, an individual process to bring about the best result and to get the job done. Thank you. The next question will be from Mr. McKinney for Ms. Willis. Uh, this question, I have actually two separate questions for each of you. Um, dealing with your judicial philosophy based on some statements you've made, uh, public statements you've made during the campaign. Um, Ms. Willis, you said in your response to the OCBA candidate questionnaire, um, the question to you was, when called upon to interpret the law, what considerations do you believe appropriate and what, if anything, should not be considered? And your response there was, when interpreting the law, I believe the plain language of the statute should rule along with cases that have been decided interpreting that law. law. Where the language is unclear, I believe it is fair to try and ascertain the original intent of the legislator as much as possible. Personal and or public opinion should not be a factor considered when deciding in the interpretation of law. My question to you is, what would you do to, quote, try and ascertain the original intent of the legislator? What does that mean? The plain language of the statute is the best starting point. Uh, sometimes there is ambiguity in that. And when that happens, I think there are other sources that you can look to. Uh, you can look to um, how other jurisdictions have interpreted similar language to see what their intent was. Uh, it's usually pretty difficult to go back and try and find out what the actual legislator's intent was. But sometimes there are notes, there are, you know, uh, things that have been written down as the bill was making its way through. I currently sit on a criminal jurisprudence committee and we often have different variations of a bill that's presented to us on that committee uh, that's either rejected or accepted. And I know that oftentimes there are notes that are associated with that. And so I think those are things that can be looked at when we're looking at a statute where there is amb ambiguity uh, and there's uncertainty about what the language actually means. Uh, Mr. Ackerman, on your website, uh, it says, quote, judges should not have an agenda, close quote, and that we are, quote, sorely in need of common sense in the judiciary. Another portion of your website says that, quote, judges are supposed to interpret the law, close quote, rather, quote, than rewrite them from the bench, close quote. Can you give an example of one, a judge with an agenda, or two, a judge rewriting the law from the bench? I'm not gonna disparage any particular individuals. I have a general philosophy that I think is neutral in its, in, in, in its um, application and its results, which is that judges should try to follow the law as it's written. But I said in my candidate statement, First, you look to whether there's precedent interpreting the statute. You look to whether the Supreme Court has, has interpreted it, then the Court of Appeals. You have to follow that, even if you think it's an incorrect interpretation. And then after that, you try to follow the plain meaning of the text. 
Um, I think there's a there's a great line from Justice uh, Elaine Kagan. Uh, we're all textualists now, and I think that that is a fair, neutral philosophy to try to say what the law is, not what you think it should be. And I think there have been um, instances where, um, you know, in both directions, judges uh, insert their political preferences to reach outcomes that I don't think are um, and I, 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 that, that I don't think are the correct interpretation of the law, but that's what they would prefer. And that's something that I will not do. <coughs> Thank you. Um, what are the biggest challenges facing the Court of Appeals and how would you implement any improvements? And we'll go back to Mr. Eckerman. So the, the average time for a disposition in our Court of Appeals right now the last year was 13.8 months. And I think that's really bad. Um, our Court of Appeals handles all types of appeals and some of them are extremely sensitive. We're talking something like, you know, an appeal from a child custody uh, decision. We need, judge, we need to make sure that we're getting those opinions out for the sake of the public. I think that's extremely important. I am very punctual. I am a high motor. I want to get things done as soon as possible. And I would like to figure out ways um, to, to see maybe using my experience as a law clerk for judges that were known for putting opinions out quickly. A lot of the time we'd have one drafted right after our argument, um, you know, within a couple of days um, and use that experience and see what I can do to improve uh, with my unique perspective, uh, the average time that we have for a disposition, because I think 14 months is way too long when you have highly sensitive appeals. Thank you, Ms. Willis. I think one of the uh, hindrances that we have is uh, lack of access to the Court of Appeals for many people. Uh, when you're talking about cases that are in the lower courts and your criminal courts and in your civil courts, oftentimes people can afford to barely sometimes to bring those cases uh, to the court. But when you begin to speak about Court of Appeals appealing cases, the additional cost that um, comes along with that, oftentimes people who need uh, an appeal are just unable to afford it. And so I believe that um, the uh, limited access that some people have to the court system is problematic. Uh, there are cases that are ripe for an appeal that should be appealed um, where people simply cannot afford to do it, to go through the process. And I think that's problematic. Thank you. The next question will be from Mr. McKinney, and it will go to Ms. Willis. Um, when you sit down in front of the Court of Appeals, one of the first things they will tell you at the beginning of every oral argument session is that the court has read all the briefs, it has read research reports about the cases, it is well-versed in the facts and in the law. And it leads some people to believe that oral argument is not of any value to the Court of Appeals or is rarely re relied upon by the judges of the Court of Appeals. Uh, my question to you is, how do you plan to use oral argument in helping you to decide cases that would be before you as a Court of Appeals judge? I think oral argument is important. Uh, one of the reasons I believe it's important is it kind of goes back to how everyone has a different style. You have some individuals who are great writers and then you have some individuals who are great orators. And so I think it allows opportunity for both individuals to be able to argue their cases uh, to the full extent that they can. And as a Court of Appeals judge, um, I think I would use that opportunity to gather more insight and information uh, about the case than what I could from the paper. I mean, as a Court of Appeals judge, you are making a decision based on the transcript and based on the record below it. But oftentimes it's just, a, it's, it's black and white. And, and, and when you listen to an individual make an argument, you're able to gather a little bit more insight about um, the issues that are being brought before you. And so I would use that um, oral argument time uh, to, for that opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Eckerman? So I, I think there actually are limits to the usefulness of oral argument that, that people generally understand. When you get written briefs, it cites to the record and you can look that up and confirm that it was, it's correct. When people cite to case law, you can go and look up and read that case. The majority of work Court of Appeals judges do is behind closed doors. Oral arguments are great for clarifying points, clearing things up, seeing how to resolve cases where they're 
Um, you know, I sometimes multiple reasons you could affirm, um, but I, I do think that there are limits to it. That said, I think it's, it's, it's important to give everyone uh, who desires it an opportunity to explain their case. And sometimes they, they can do it better orally. I just, um, I'm hesitant to, you know, I, I, as in my experience as a law clerk, I, I didn't see any cases where someone created a new oral ar argument in, uh, in oral advocacy that it didn't contain in their brief that changed the outcome of the case. Thank you. Next question is from Mr. Curvan and it will go to Mr. Eckerman. Uh, describe a pro bono case you handled and what you learned from it. So um, one pro bono activity that I've done is uh, taking on using my skill set, which is legal research and writing, something that I love doing, and taking on um, research assignments for the Conviction Integrity Unit of the McComb Prosecutor's Office, which acts as an innocence project sort of uh, a unit. They review uh, convictions to see if uh, people were, um, uh, in, you know, incorrectly convicted of something they didn't do. Um, one case that I performed research assignments on was for Mac Howell, who was re released from prison because he had been wrongfully convicted. Um, I really enjoyed the opportunity to read through his jury transcript and the evidence and try to write a legal memorandum, even if I was an incredibly small part of it. I don't want to take any credit for the outcome, but um, it, it was an honor to be able to have the opportunity to do that legal research and writing uh, for the unit. I think it's it's a great thing that they're doing in these conviction integrity units. Thank you. Ms. Willis? Oh, yeah, Ms. Willis? So as an assistant prosecuting attorney, my ability to practice outside of the prosecutor's office is very limited. Uh, and I am with few exception, not able to really practice outside of that office. I do, however, um, spend time uh, that I believe is valuable in the community, educating the community about, um, for instance now, how to avoid becoming uh, the victim of mortgage and deed fraud. I also take time to educate uh, and to train uh, police officers about how to investigate mortgage and deed fraud cases because these are not the common cases that come across an officer's desk. And so I spend time um, doing that. I also have committed time volunteering um, at a local ministry and I've done that for over 20 years. And so I find time to give back to the community in other ways uh, that I'm unable to do because of job constraints. Thank you. Um, next question. And this will start with Ms. Willis. What endorsements do you have from what organizations or people? So I am happy to say that I have earned the endorsement of uh, over 34 judicial um, judges, uh, different um, officers <clears throat> and uh, unions. Offhand, I'm sorry, I don't remember them all, but unions, uh, I have the UAW support, I have AFL, CIO, I have the uh, Michigan Education Association. I have uh, a variety of judicial endorsements from judges from Wayne County, Oakland County, Macomb County, Genesee County. I have the endorsement of the Genesee prosecutor, the Wayne County prosecutor, the Genesee sheriff. Uh, and I have been rated as well by the Women's uh, Lawyers Association as Outstanding, which is their highest rating. I've also received the highest rating of the Wolverine Bar Association, uh, which is uh, extremely quali qualified. And so I have a number of endorsements from various judges and organizations that I'm very proud of. Thank you. Mr. Eckerman. I am endorsed by a bipartisan majority of our Michigan Supreme Court, along with both Republican and Democratic politicians, such as Governor John Engler, Governor Jim Blanchard, over 25 circuit court and district court judges within Oakland County, which is where we are, the Oakland County Bar Association. I am endorsed by Sheriff Michael Bouchard. I'm endorsed by former prosecutors uh, Dave Gorsica, Jessica Cooper, um, I have the rest of my endorsements uh, listed on my website, which you can find online. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, uh, we'll start with Mr. Ackerman. It's going to be from Mr. Kirby. 
How do you plan to manage a heavy caseload and prioritize cases? So I have experience uh, in the wake of COVID-19 when there was a lot of litigation and I was working really hard as a law clerk as uh, there were constant issues with civil liberties and constitutional rights in the wake of pandemic responses in the Second Circuit, which contained New York. Um, I thrive when I'm working hard. It's something that I love to do. I, I have done so my entire life, whether it was in school, whether it's been as a practitioner, I am organized, I am efficient, and, and I will give this my all. I, I don't do things at 50%. I always give them my all, and I'm confident that I can manage the docket and get opinions that are extremely high quality, well-reasoned, well explained out on a very timely fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Willis. Can you repeat the question one more time? Yes. Uh, how do you plan to manage a heavy caseload and prioritize cases? Well, that has been my entire career at the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. In the time that I've been there, literally, I've, I've handled thousands of cases and uh, I feel that this will just be a progression of what I have done for the last 21 years. I will handle that type of a heavy docket the same way that I handle uh, the dockets that I handle now, and that is prioritize, you manage, you, you work, you prioritize, you manage, and you work. You just get the, you get the job done. You give each case uh, the individual attention that it deserves that it must have, and you you simply just keep going. And, and that's what I would do. I am built for this work. I've been doing it for 21 years. Uh, I'm not tired yet. And I will, I look forward to continuing uh, a heavy docket um, of cases. Thank you. Uh, the next question will go to Ms. Willis and it will be uh, from Mr. McKinney. Uh, the current status quo in the Court of Appeals regarding oral arguments and the use of Zoom or remote technology is that judges at their own discretion can appear remotely for oral arguments. Attorneys, however, need to ask the court's permission to appear remotely for oral arguments. Uh, my question to each of you is, do you want to see this status quo continue? Would you advocate a change to this status quo? You, I actually think that Zoom is highly productive, effective, and efficient when you are talking about hearings, oral arguments, uh, anything aside from actual uh, trials and examinations, I believe Zoom is a very effective um, source. And I would actually welcome the use of it, not just for the judges, but for, um, for the attorneys that are involved. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay, Mr. Ackerman. Well, first off, I think that judges should hold themselves to a higher standard than the people appearing before them. So if you're going to require an excuse or a reason not to appear in court as a litigant, then the judges should do the same. If people are in person, I promise that I will do my best unless there's something catastrophic happening, happening that, to not be there in person. On the you know, before we had all these Zoom discussions versus in person, we still had questions about whether to waive or take oral argument, and we still have those as well. I've seen how that plays out in person. On the Fifth Circuit, I thought that they had a, a unique practice of um, they would waive oral argument only if both sides agreed to waive it uh, together, because if one wanted it, the other could, you know, could still participate, even if they said they didn't need oral argument. And I think that a similar process could work great for zoom versus in person i think that the default should be in person but if both sides agree to do it uh through zoom then i think that there should be an accommodation uh, that way no time okay thank you okay thank you and this will go back to mr eckerman are there any specific types of cases in which you would find it necessary to disqualify yourself so i think that judges should take a broad view of what they need to disqualify themselves in. So that means that if, if anyone in my family has a personal financial interest or anything that could be even remotely viewed as unbecoming or 
biased. I think that I would be more on the side of erring on caution in terms of recusal, but I can't think of off the top of my head right now, any specific area of law in which I would have to recuse myself. No matter what, I have to clear my head and try to see what the law is and, and put away any preconceived notions or biases I may have. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Willis? As an assistant prosecuting attorney, I would be obligated to recuse myself from certain criminal cases, certain cases that come from our office, appeals from our office for a period of time. Aside from that, I can't think of any other cases that I would need to step down from. Thank you. Next question will come from Mr. McKinney and it will go to uh, Ms. Willis. Can you give a specific professional legal experience you have that you believe will help you in your work as a court of appeals judge? I believe that the experience that I have had inside of the courtroom will help tremendously. Uh, the Court of Appeals is the error correcting court and it's the court where we are, you know, judges are tasked with the assignment of reviewing the decisions that are being made by judges and lawyers, attorneys below. And I have an actual firsthand up close uh, knowledge of what happens in those trial courtrooms. When I a review a trial transcript. I'm not just looking at a transcript and reading it. I have a thorough understanding of what actually happened to compile, to, to, to form that transcript. What happens uh, in the courtroom? I have uh, brought, I uh, have had jury trials. I've had bench trials. I've had evidentiary hearings. I know what happens when a transcript is, uh, is, is made and, and composed. And so I think that that experience is extremely useful and necessary and has prepared me uh, to be a judge for the Court of Appeals. Thank you. Mr. Eckerman. So I, I too have tried jury and bench cases, um, but I, I also have this extremely unique perspective of reviewing and doing the appeals from several trials where I, you know, see how you supposed to, how you navigate the issues presented before you. Um, and I think that this unique perspective of having clerked on two federal counterparts, the level below our United States Supreme Court in different regions, where I got to see how two different courts operated, what the best practices were, what went well, what didn't go as well, and then can bring that information and how chambers works and how to work with your colleagues and come to a consensus and write dissents and majority opinions. I think that that experience is extremely unique. And I think that I would bring a, 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 a extremely different perspective that, that, that most people do not have. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will be for Mr. Ackerman from Mr. Kervan. What are your thoughts on the use of TV cameras in court? Uh, do you see them as an unnecessary disruption or do they help promote a better understanding of our system of justice i think it's not, it's more than just a better understanding it's 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 uh opening our courtrooms is essential to having uh, a transparent system that people can trust and understand and that's accessible to everyone um, i think it's good for young attorneys to be able to see how the court operates learn best practices and i think it's good for the transparency of everyone having access to information and knowing what's going on in cases that said, there, you know, this is especially at the appellate stage um, that, that that would be the case. Um, thank you. Ms. Willis? I see it as a combination of both. Um, I do believe that it, there, it, it, it increases transparency. It's good for the public to be able to observe cases and to see what's going on. But I also know that um, I, I see it from a perspective of victims and defendants who are in the courtroom. Oftentimes, it's it's difficult to come into a courtroom and to sit in a case just on a normal day. You come in there, you're sitting in front of a bunch of people that you've never seen before, and you're telling very uh, detailed and intimate um, details about something that has happened to you. Uh, and so to that's already a difficult thing, but to then do that in front of cameras, just it also, you know, it, it creates a bit of a hindrance for victims, for defendants, 
um, for parties involved. And so while I believe that the cameras in the courtroom are a good thing, I've had them in the courtroom on many a trial, uh, I think that they have to be, it has to be done in a way that minimizes uh, disruption to the courtroom and the court process itself. Thank you. Uh, this question will go back to Ms. Willis. And, um, and then this will be the last round of questions. So we'll each have one more question. <laughs> If you observe a party in your courtroom being poorly represented by an unprepared or ineffective lawyer, how would you handle the situation? Unfortunately, this is not an uncommon occurrence, and but it's one that it's, it's, it's delicate because, you know, subjectively speaking, what I think is poor representation may not be, you know, poor representation across the board. And so I believe in those situations where by any objective standard, uh, the there is poor representation that's happening, then I have an obligation as a judge to uh, call the parties forward to try and see whether or not there's something that's happening on this particular day that's causing, you know, the attorney to operate uh, at a level that's below standard. Uh, and if it's, you know, perhaps there's something that can be done on that particular day to adjourn the matter, to allow the uh, party to get into a better space, or maybe there has to be uh, a withdrawal or a sitting down of a particular attorney, but I believe that it's a process that has to be um, weighed carefully because individuals have the right to hire whoever they want to hire. And so who I think is ineffective may not be ineffective to that individual. Thank you. Mr. Eckerman. Well, first, I want to note that especially as a, in an appellate court, there are limits to what you can do. Um, you have written briefs and a lot of the time if you don't raise an argument, you waive it and there's nothing you can do in terms of calling someone to the bench and correcting that. Um, there are different contexts in terms of criminal and civil. I think that in criminal, it is uh, even more sensitive depending on the case. But uh, the Michigan Rule of Professional Ethics 1.1 requires competent representation. And if there's incompetent representation, I'd be sensitive about uh, making sure to report it and seeing um, what resources to do, depending on the facts of the case, whether it's civil or criminal. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Mr. Kervan to Mr. Eckert. Uh, you've touched on this in your opening remarks, but I'd like you to delve into it a little bit more about what inspired you to become a judicial candidate. The best job, I, I love my practice now. I have legal issues, really interesting legal issues. I love my clients and I think that they don't deserve what they're having to deal with. But the best job I had in terms of the day to day was as an appellate law clerk. I got to learn different areas of law and spend all my day reading lengthy, difficult briefs, researching what the law was and drafting opinions. And that was perfect for me. It's a nerdy job. A lot of people wouldn't like it. It's a lot of legal research and writing. It's like writing a book report over and over again on different topics, reading that you don't know anything about to start. A lot of people that it would not appeal to a lot of people. It really appeals to me. And that's why I'm running for the Court of Appeals specifically. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Willis. I'm specifically running for the Court of Appeals because as an assistant prosecutor, I do realize how important it is not just to get a just decision in, in your courtroom, but to make sure that that decision is upheld or, or in the later process. And so I'm running because I believe that our courts, our Court of Appeals needs experienced individuals. I talk to a lot of judges, a lot of lawyers who sit on the lower courts, who uh, feel a certain way about judges who are on the Court of Appeals who have no trial courtroom experience and are reviewing their decisions, making a decision about whether or not they made the right call. And so I understand that and I can relate that to that completely. Uh, and I believe that I'm running for this seat specifically because it matters the experience uh, that we have on the Court of Appeals. Uh, we're setting precedent for cases for, for generations to come and we need to have individuals who are experienced sitting on those seats. Thank you. Uh, next question is from, or last, the very last question is gonna be from Mr. McKinney for Ms. Willis. Trial court judges make decisions and that's it. Their decision is their decision, on to the next item. 
Appeals court judges are a little different. They're just one of three votes on a panel. How would you go about persuading a fellow judge to sign on to an opinion you were writing? One of the things that um, I like about the Court of Appeals is that you are not making a decision solely on your own. That's one of the burdens of a trial court judge is it, the burden rests solely on that trial court judge to make the right decision at that time. One of the benefits of the Court of Appeals judges is that they do work in a panel. And I believe that it's a, it's a collaborative experience. I myself welcome the collaborative experience. I think that I would go about trying to convince my colleague to sign on to uh, one of my opinions simply by presenting what I believe are the merits to my argument, laying those out uh, and hoping that they would see the merits of that argument. Thank you, Mr. Eckerman. So I got to see this a little bit firsthand in two different circuits handling the consensus and reaching a result different ways. And I've seen some best practices that I would like to, I, you know, I'm going to start out by seeing how people do it, but maybe incorporate. On the second circuit, you can write a, a voting memo explaining in, sh you know, uh, short language, not a full opinion, what you think that the result should be. And, and I think that doing it in written word where people can look up the cases and check you and then respond is, is a very productive way. But having positive relationships where you can call the other judges and discuss it and reach a consensus, which in some cases may mean you need a narrow decision, but that's important. And that's something that I think I will have as a strength based on my perspective and what I've seen in different places and how they've done this. Thank you. That concludes the time for questions. The candidates will now be given one minute to make closing statements in the reverse order of the opening statements, beginning with Ms. Willis. Thank you all for taking this evening to spend with us. I just want to say that uh, I am running for this seat because I believe experience matters. I believe integrity matters and I believe representation matters. Uh, I have dedicated my entire legal career to one of public service, not because uh, of the pay of the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office or because of the benefits of the Prosecutor's Office. I've dedicated my career to public service because I have a heart to serve this community. I have spent 21 years fighting to protect uh, the rights of individuals within the state of Michigan. And as a sitting judge on the Court of Appeals, I would continue to fight to protect the integrity of our Court of Appeals. I'm asking for your vote this November 5th for the Michigan Court of Appeals. Thank you. Mr. Eckerman. If you think the trial court erred on a difficult issue in your case, I'm who you want to be on the panel reviewing it. I have the intellect to navigate the difficult issue, research and find what the law is. Um, I graduated with high honors at Harvard, top of my class at Columbia Law School. I was on law review. I've demonstrated my intellect throughout my career. I have the experience, both courtroom and appellate, of handling both trials and appeals and having the experience of being an appellate law clerk at the federal, federal counterpart to what we do. And I have the drive, I have the motivation. I have clearly demonstrated that in my free time on top of a legal, a busy legal practice, I write legal articles, I present at national conferences. You can look up my OCBA forum. I gave over a dozen writing samples. Um, I'm going to teach at Michigan State's Law School this year. That's another ex exciting way for me because I love the law. I love those difficult legal issues, and I'm the one that will navigate them and make sure that the trial court didn't err in your case. And if they did, I will work my hardest to, to fix it and write an opinion and clearly explaining what the law should be. Thank you. Thank you. The sponsors would like to thank the candidates and audience for their participation. For further nonpartisan information on these candidates, check the league, of, uh, the league website for our voter guide at lwvoa.org or connect with vote411.org. Links to the recording of this forum will be on the LWVOA and the OCBA websites. The League of Women Voters is funded by contributions from concerned businesses and citizens. Our membership is open to women and men over the age of 16. Remember, you can vote early at your in your community for your early voting location from October 26th through November 3rd or at your precinct on November 5th. Remember, democracy is not a spectator sport. 
Thank you and have a great evening.